Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So nice to see so many of you attending all the all the different sessions that we've had today. So because I'm seeing a lot of common names. Um, before we get started, uh, if you require captions, you can click on the transcript or closed caption button somewhere within your Zoom window. Uh, you probably more are very familiar with it. Uh, I'd like to thank Sarah and Rachel who are providing ASL interpretation for this session. So thank you to them. My name is Kenji Maeda, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm located on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that the CRD conducts its business on the territories of over 20 First Nations, including that of the Songhees and the Squamalt Nations in the core area, Wasainich uh, Nations, including Sartlip, uh, Pauquichin, Sayout, and Seikum of the Saanich Peninsula and Gulf Islands, Chianu, Beecher Bay, uh, Tseok, and Pachida uh, to the west, as well as Malahach and Penelicate, uh, the nations, all of whom have lived on these lands since time immemorial. Um, if you have any questions as the panel conversation unfolds, please feel free to type them in the chat window and we will try to weave together um, those questions as part of the, the course over the next 40 minutes before we go into breakout rooms. Um, I'm gonna invite the, the panelists, like it's Vimala to um, uh, have the panelists show up on the window and show up on the Zoom screen. And we're uh, delighted to have our four guests here today who include Charles Campbell, uh, Reagan Shrum, Sarah Jim, and Sean Geist. And we are going to start off with a round of self introductions. And um, I see Charles here and Sarah. So why don't we start off with Charles? We're going to go alphabetically. Charles, uh, a bit of an introduction from, from you then. Hi. Um... My name is Charles Campbell. I go by he, him pronouns. I'm currently coming to you from Lekwungen territory, um, otherwise known as Victoria, BC. I'm very grateful to be able to spend here. I've lived here since about 2002. Um, I'm a Jamaican born visual artist, um, sometimes a curator, sometimes a writer. Um, probably this experience that's most relevant to this conversation we're going to have um, are the sort of three years that I spent um, as the president of Open Space Art Society um, and also maybe some of the work I did at the National Gallery of Jamaica um, as well where I was a curator so um, that's me. Thank you I will go over to Reagan. Uh, my name is Reagan Trum. I am a queer uh, and disabled curator, artist, educator. Uh, I currently mostly uh, work on the lens of the Clayton Tenay people in Prince George at the Two Rivers Art Gallery, uh, though I am situated on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. Um, also in Victoria, I work uh, through contracts with the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria and the Integrate Arts Society. Thank you. And we'll go over to Sarah. It's great, Jill Hala, Sarah Jim, Thunasnet, Chesalasnet, Husanich. Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Jim. I'm from Husanich, from the Saikum Village. Um, on my dad's side, we're Coast Salish and Mexican from Saikum. And on my mom's side, we're Russian Jewish. And I work as a visual artist. Um, I'm, I also work on the landing environmental restoration. Um, I got a BFA from UVic and I've been working as an artist for the past probably seven years or so. And I'm happy to be here. Hi, Chika. Thank you. And then Sean. Hi, everyone. My name is Sean Guest. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Um, uh, I'm on staff here at Intrepid Theater, uh, but I'm also a freelance artist. And I, I like to say that I am a, I like the words multi hyphenate artist. Uh, I, I do. Um, a lot in, I work in theater and opera primarily, uh, a lot of times in new work creation, uh, in producing, um, directing, uh, and sometimes I even put on a wig and heels and do some drag, um, which leads me to a lot of, of fun events and also to host fundraisers and contribute to the arts in many ways. Um, that's me in, in a quick intro. Thanks, Kenji. 
Great, thank you. And we're just gonna go right into it. And we're gonna just start off with the big question, um, which is the theme of this, this topic. And it's about um, what are the big changes that you think are, are, are needed to make the arts community more equitable? And I'm gonna throw it to you, Sean, first. Uh, thanks, Kenji. Um, I've, we've been had a pre-panel meeting and I've been thinking about this a lot. And, and the piece that I wanna throw into the conversation is, 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 has a couple prongs in it. And I think it's, I'm gonna start by saying who, I've been thinking a lot about who gets to decide who is an artist, who gets to decide what art is valuable or professional or fundable. Um, and also how can we move forward with funding individual artists and supporting artists and not just not-for-profits or collectives or organizations. So I know that's kind of a couple pieces there, but that's what I wanted to, to start with. You wanna uh, dig deeper into that a little bit? Yeah, um, I've, I've been thinking a, a, a lot about, you know, a lot of the, the talking about equitable uh, equity and, and funding pieces too. And, and a, lot of, a lot of what you have to do is check boxes. And you have to say that you're this, you make this kind of art or this kind of art, and it has to be um, pr professional in, in certain cases. And I, I've been thinking a lot about why that is and how we can change that, because I think there are a lot of art forms and there are a lot of artists who are left out um, because they don't fit these overall catch all boxes that we have to check on grant application forms or festival application forms or residency applications. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that and, and also about how a lot of funding opportunities are not available for individual artists. They're not available for, for artists who have ideas. They want funding to explore, push their craft or dig into some big questions that they have because they're not uh, not for profit. They're not working for an organization. So there's, there's some barriers in the way of how we're, how artists are able to support themselves and support their work. And when we look at what's equitable, we need to be able to support all sorts of disciplines and voices and at various stages of their career. So that's what I've been thinking about. Um, uh, Reagan, why don't we go to you? What are you thinking about? Yeah, uh, so many things come uh, to mind. Um, but really, I'd like to kind of broaden out, uh, you know, in the last session, Jesse mentioned how many artists are kind of leaving um, the field because it's just not a sustainable one at all. Uh, and when you look within the Capital Regional District, but also uh, within Greater BC, um, it's just expensive. <laughs> Things are expensive. Housing in particular is unavailable. And the arts, uh, you know, if you're an arts administrator, often it is not a living wage. If you're an artist, it is well below a living wage unless you are um, getting certain commissions. Uh, and it's really thinking about that broader of how can arts organizations be helping these bigger issues. So it's not just about housing, it's, you know, we're in this time of uh, social transformation. Um, uh, there's things like, you know, food scarcity, there's things such as the environmental crisis that are currently happening. And I really have seen some amazing art that has been done to address those kinds of issues. I think of um, uh, the work Parasite, uh, which was a Montreal based artist who um, created like temporary homes for those experiencing homelessness. And I wonder how can artists, you know, create art in this time of social transformation? How can um, our organizations extract resources um, as, as uh, Cyrus Marcus Wares talks about uh, giving it to what is actually needed be it housing, be it food, be it trying to um, uh, combat or slow down the climate uh, crisis. Um, I really think there's sometimes an oversaturation of arts that maybe not arts that um, will help the greater community 
Um, and I really liked that quote that Jesse talked about in the last session of uh, no one does anything alone. You climb together as a community. That one really stuck in my brain as something that uh, we need to take care of everyone in our community. Um, and that means the people who have had the most barriers uh, to things such as arts, but other things such as housing, food, et cetera. Great, thank you. Um, Charles, we'll go over to you. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, and thanks, thanks both uh, Reagan and Sean. Um, yeah, the thing that's been a little bit on my mind when I first read this prompt was exactly how we're defining equity um, from the beginning and, and taking the courage to actually dig into what we want to achieve rather than um, existing on sort of vague, <laughs> vague platitudes. And I think so what are we looking for, you know, equity in more diverse programming? Are we looking for um, you know, actually a change in the nature of organizations and who gets who gets to decide what stories are told or what art gets made, because that's um, ends up being the job of the the arts organizations themselves. And then we're talking about governance. Um, I was really interested in what Jesse was saying at the end um, of his talk when he was talking about, you know, we're not seeking equity. He was talking about indigenous communities, not seeking equity, but seeking sovereignty. And that really, really resonated for me because and I um, as something that we're equity, it seems like it's something that's doled out to, to people um, and it's and it's almost built on a scarcity model. Oh, we'll give you a little bit of this and we'll let you have a little bit of that. And um, it's about how you portion a pre-existing pie um, where I don't know, I, I'm wondering if that conversation can start to shift a little bit about how we include more voices in the actual decisions that are made, um, how, um, yeah, how, how these conversations actually need to be, need to be transformed to, to really enable the full potential of everyone. And that's what we're trying to do rather than piece out little pieces of the pie. And I know that that's, it's going to be at odds with some of the funding models and there's always going to be challenges around that. Um, but but starting from this from us from a bigger vision i think might might be might be helpful thank you charles sarah i love that charles i wish i listened to jesse's talk now but <laughs> yeah the sovereignty pieces that really resonated with me because I feel like what needs to be facilitated more is empowerment. And Sean was talking about meeting people where they are in different stages of their life or career. And so I was thinking having more like kind of art programs in school would be really helpful because this kind of teaches kids that being an artist is, is can be an actual career or something to pursue. Um, but what Reagan said about, you know, artists can't survive in this, in this city or in certain places because of the lack of work or the expensive housing and all these things. So yeah, I just want to um, just acknowledge what everyone else has said about all these valid reasons of um, unequal opportunities. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was just dismantling colonial barriers would be a really good aspect um, toward equity because, you know, sometimes they're these lengthy forms that may or may not make sense. And as an indigenous artist, like we grew as an oral people. And so kind of dismantling these um, application kind of formal, formalized processes might be a bit of an opening for some people. Um, I was inspired by this, um, by Shwana Nito who, kind of implemented this grant process by you can like call them on the phone and say what you wanted to do instead of writing like a giant essay about what you were going to do so, so that's just something I wanted to mention. It's interesting just coming going off of that Sarah because um, Heritage and Vancouver Foundation they um, certain programs will allow for video 
uh, based applications. And I, it's, we, we do see it more, more now, but definitely not, uh, not enough. And, and I think, uh, you know, Jesse was talking a lot uh, about the funding kind of more um, funder institution changes that he thinks that uh, could be implemented or should be Im implemented. And he's trying to kind of uh, reshape in terms of Canada Council and other places. But I, I wonder, because a lot of the folks who are attending right now and kind of um, witnessing this conversation are those administrators. They are the artists um, uh, on the ground. And what are some things that, you know, that you might be able to kind of suggest for folks um, when they're working directly with artists or uh, working in their very small kind of bootstrapped organization and just trying to desperately survive? Like, what are some thoughts that um, any of you have around uh, those realities and change um, and change that can be happen uh, that can happen there? Um, I'll have a quick go at that. I mean, I think um, one of the comments earlier around this, how resources are distributed, I think is relevant here that um, often organizations have access to, um, well, varying levels of, of resources, um, both in terms of the people that are there and, and the financial resources and almost seeing your job as, as, as one of redistribution that you're, you're actually part of the job you have to do is, is pass that down the line um, and enable enable people to have access to, to gain to gain access I think is an, a sort of an important attitude to to develop and to understand um, I think you have to really a lot of organizations have to do, do a lot more work to understand the context that they're working in not um, not in terms of the you know necessarily their the existing audience demographics or, or actually starting maybe with their existing audi audience demographics and then understanding actually the 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 gaps that are that are there because um you know i think often people pretend they're serving for one thing and they're actually serving another <laughs> and actually looking at yourself and seeing actually who comes through the door who which artists do we employ um who who's getting paid who's doing the volunteer labor um you know who is getting to make the decisions once you actually dig into that stuff you realize that actually you're not actually a very equitable organization for a lot for a lot of organizations and and committing making the commitment to actually move that along and and that's, i'm not saying that that's easy work because i think in the in the arts you know f for definitely for level of education it's that everyone is on poverty wages like in, <laughs> it seems like that there's there's a there is a sense that no one is getting a fair deal and therefore what you kind of look at your own deal and said oh that's not a fair deal therefore you know how 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 come i'm expected to share it so it's a, it's it's always going to be a difficult conversation within within the arts because the arts themselves are um are often f feel feel themselves to be very tenuous and everyone everyone's position within it often feels really tenuous Again, I saw a lot of head nodding. Did you have a thing to jump off from there? Uh, a little bit of jumping off, um, uh, but also your comment, Kenji, about you know our organizations being um, overwhelmed by the amount of things, uh, maybe leading to burnout. It, it makes me think of um, the Grunt Gallery in uh, Vancouver is has been starting, I think, this past year of programming through a trauma-informed lens. So thinking through not only the programming, but how together as a staff, they can help support each other. You know, um, it makes me think of ways that you can um, program rest as part of your practice as an organization, and also to think through ways that um, to try to defy uh, some of the, the funding uh, timelines, which are, again, this very colonial way of um, you need to have this deadline. Within the disability uh, community, uh, Tiffany alluded to this, there's a concept of spoon theory in which you only have so many uh, spoons um, of, of energy to give. And I think that way of, of looking at time um, is something that you can see throughout 
um, even like indigenous uh, and, and BIPOC uh, ways of like um, not following the structure of, of, of formal time um, and kind of spending more time as an organization investigating as Charles said your own creating if the if the grants want that to be a program saying that is a, a type of private program that you are doing that you're self investigating just as grant is doing uh, so that you can know yourselves as an organization and therefore um, further the helpfulness that will be coming and lessen the burnout that may be happening to staff. I mean, when we talk about burnout, uh, not not only for for staff, but artists as well. And I, I think go back to kind of Sean, what you're talking about around um, who who funds or how how can we make sure artists are supported, or how can how can we ensure that resources are going to the right places, and maybe without the middle person, because that's kind of what um, a lot of artists and actually arts workers are relying on is. To be hired from one gig to another. Um, there's a lot of contract marketing people, there's a lot of contract tech folks, you know, and, and also our artists. But um, yeah, that, that just comes to mind. I, I don't know, Sean, if you want to uh, go further into that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, but there's also something that Jesse was talking about too, which was, which was giving up and sharing power. And I think that's a piece too. I think that, that things are often structured like this and they don't have to be like what happens when we open it up and we flatten things or, or we share the power is shared, but also the work is shared, but also the excitement is shared and the, the curation is shared or whatever that looks like. And I think there's a lot that can be collaborative. That's not. And I think that's one thing that we can really, you know, take on and, and have conversations about and, and maybe really have some some deep hard thoughts about how we can actually collaborate and i think part of that is is collaborating to flatten things so that um you know the the workload is shared but so is kind of that you know we kind of say some people say you know well who is it who who stays up at night stressing about things and and it should be the top of this but but if you kind of spread that out then then you share some of that and and going back to what I was saying off the top too, is, is who decides what's valuable and professional. And, and if we kind of, if things are a bit decentralized, then I think that's really exciting. And, and it does open things up across organizations, but also for artists. And, and Kenji, we were talking the other day about uh, check boxes and, and how, you know, often comedy or, or drag is not included in, in those. And I think it's often because someone at some point decided that they weren't real art. So therefore they should not be included on this form. And now those forms are still in existence. So um, yeah, there's just, just how can we, how can we share and how can we decentralize and how can we give up power and empower others? I think. Um, one of the earlier presentations. Uh, so the morning presentation, I, I shared one one slide around the fact that BC, the um, Indigenous and, and racialized folks make up 36% of BC's population, but only 20% of uh, arts leaders and 22% of um, arts board members. And in some ways, I, I feel like Sarah, when you were talking about like dismantling colonial barriers, I mean the nonprofit structure itself is also um, part of that challenge. Is the is the barrier of, of the Society Act and to because it's actually built like this, or it's actually the board, the top multiple board members, and often like one or two staff members. Um, but it, yeah, that's that kind of struck me in terms of what you were saying, Sarah. Um, around structures, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of say a point about what Reagan was saying about trauma informed, like conducting yourself in a trauma informed way. Um, as the arts get more equitable or like more um, marginalized or BIPOC or queer disabled artists get into the the funding stream a lot more um 
it's very important for these spaces to be culturally safe for these people. Um, you know, tokenizing is easily happens. Like Sean was saying, you know, you check up, you check off a box and you're like, okay, we have an indigenous artist now, like, look how inclusive we are. But that doesn't mean that these places are like culturally safe for, for these people. Um, so I feel like that's a really good point to bring up. Um, it would be like, I don't have the answers to this, but I feel like, you know, settlers and allies and people who are conducting these grants or programs should do their research and do some education around, you know, how to be trauma informed or culturally safe. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up, <laughs> whenever you do apply for like a, an open call or something like this, you're asked to write like a budget and a timeline and how many materials and all these things that you just kind of project and you don't really know yet. As like an emerging artist who really has no idea what I'm doing, it would be good to have, you know, like an art resource person to help you along the way um, with this process. Because immediately you're supposed to be seen as this professional person, but really artists are like the least professional professions. <laughs> um, there we can be, but like philosophically art is like meant to be expressive and all these things, which isn't always conducive to being professional, but that's just something I wanted to add. Um, if you are having these open calls, it would be good to designate someone within your organization as this like resource person to kind of help the artists along the way, especially for like young and up and coming um, artists such as myself, because I've kind of just been stumbling my way through all of my like projects and jobs and things like that, which is the best way to learn, but it's also nice to have that um, kind of community support. I'm going to jump to a question that we got uh, from someone who's in attendance, and it's two questions, so you can answer one or both. They have a same similar theme to it, but um, they're asking, um, what are the ways to deal with the increasing cost of living in Greater Victoria as it impacts arts practice? And given that arts neighborhoods attract gentrification and often displace arts and artists, how do we maintain space for those artists to live and or work in? So whoever wants to go. It's a hard question. Yeah, those are big questions. I mean, I think, I think we have to we have to place value on art spaces, but also on on artists. And you know, we there's a lot of there's a lot of conversation around how we can have a a vibrant and artful city or or region, but there's not a lot of conversation around how we can keep artists here, and how we can support artists. And and you know, is it about is it about artist housing? Is it about having uh, live workspaces that have subsidized artist rent um, that are close by venues or theaters or galleries. And I, these are a lot of questions that I think a lot of other cities have addressed or regions have addressed. And I think, I think we can look at some of those models. We don't always have to start from scratch. And I feel like oftentimes we always want to start from scratch instead of, instead of kind of learning and, and asking those questions from other places that are doing it. And I feel like if we can't, support artists to stay here that's where we have to start because if we don't have the artists here the art won't be here mm -hmm. we also want to jump into that, like, yeah you know artists are just kind of people um and who generally have a slightly lower, lower income than others and i mean that i think there's a much bigger conversation unfortunately around around the affordability of this of this city um and I, you know we can i think there i think there you know there would certainly would be welcome to have some some programs specifically that recognize the value of the arts in the city but there's um but i yeah i, I just feel like this is actually a much like the affordability crisis in this city and in this province is is massive and is having huge effects on so many people 
um, that you know the the speculative real estate market like it it's like colonialism it's just not working for anybody um, it's not working for the arts <laughs> um, I mean the arts can be part of the process of advocating for that I would actually hesitate to, like if if a special area is carved out for artists I think that actually there's also a responsibility on us to help carve out bigger areas for other people as well and to advocate for for broader changes because um, this um, yeah this is a much much bigger much much bigger challenge um and we don't really want to be creating a, a disneyland you know any other points to bring up from other folks around that question i have a very quixotic suggestion of having like an art tax so for all the rich people who live around here they pay a little bit and you know it kind of spreads the wealth and uh, it was brought up earlier about this like starvation mode how everyone kind of hoards what they have because they don't think there's going to be more but my kind of outlook and my teachings from Saanich culture is that when you're rich you know you give everything away so at potlatches when you're having the celebration you 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 have all these things but you give everything away to your guests and so that's just just an idea to plant in people's heads. Um, like if you are hoarding a lot of this wealth, like a virtuous thing to do would be to give it, give some, you know, share it. I mean, that that also thinking about the um, universal basic income has been, of course, a big topic of conversation over the, particularly the last couple of years um, because of CERB and CRB. Uh, and, and in particular, it's a conversation about art, artists and arts workers uh, and the precarity of their work and how that helped to support them um, in, in many ways because the sector didn't, wasn't uh, self-sustaining um, in terms of job and viability for, for, for folks as well. Um, yeah, Reagan, did you have anything to add to that part? No, not, not much uh charles's comment about um the housing uh and and how it's like colonialism and it, it doesn't work for anyone i guess it it works for those who are, are have enough money um and maybe those are the folks who yeah aren't complaining um uh and often uh maybe less so in Victoria, but sometimes those can be people on the boards uh, of art organizations. Um, sometimes those can be people uh, who are the executive directors of arts organizations um, who maybe uh, don't have too much to complain in terms of a housing. Um, so maybe again, it's about examining uh, your own board uh, um, as, as arts organizations. Um, and really kind of questioning are the values that we are saying that we have uh, as arts organizations, are those actually coming through for the board, for staff, for what we're, the programming we're doing? Um, and also I just want to, yeah, thank uh, Sarah for that beautiful uh, teaching as well and reminder um, uh, of giving away what we can. Thinking of like, um, what what are the things that you do? What that you you in your own practice for for the four of you um, that you feel like could be an inspiration for the folks who are watching today? Like, what's the one thing, or you know, the the way that you think, the what the a project that you've done that you're really like this this could be an inspiration. Um, any ideas for that? Or it could be somebody else's as well. Like, if, or if you're like, oh, this this organization or this person did this thing, and it's really inspiring to you. I I have an example. I, I think I have two. Um... Uh, so one of the projects I've been working on through the Art Gallery of Great Victoria is called Listeners and Residents, and it connects um, queer seniors with queer uh, youth 
um, to help fight uh, isolation uh, during the pandemic, um, as well as creating these intergenerational connections because often in the queer community, um, there can be a, a gap uh, between different generations. And with that is kind of a, a loss of knowledge and a, a loss of history, as well as um, for many queer seniors, they may not uh, have family um, that they're associated with. Um, so it's creating new, uh, new family. Um, and this kind of came out of, you know, talking to uh, queer folks within Victoria uh, and needing again isolation was happening throughout um, but can particularly hit some communities a lot harder than others so uh, I think again making things relevant um, making things uh, that um, are impacting people in, the, in a big way um, with this project it's not so much uh, this giant public um, program, it, it's really done through the conversations that each pairings are having through the relationships. And through that, um, there's a sense of growing community um, that will help, you know, build other relationships in the future, um, hopefully. Uh, so yeah, I think it's all about keeping things that are relevant, that are respectful, that are um, but mostly re relevant to our communities today. Uh, I, a, I um, do a monthly, um, we call it the Black Artists and Curators Salon. They're um, Black artists and um, curators from Western Canada. Um, about a year ago, I was doing a curatorial project and researching um, artists from the region and realized I didn't know a lot of the people that, um, you know, um, I knew some names, but I didn't have personal relationships with um, with a lot of the black community um, of artists here. And so we started this online, um, it's an online group, we meet once a month, nobody is paid, <laughs> nobody, it's very informally organized. Um, but it's a way for us to get together. We discuss our work. Usually somebody does a presentation um, and then we talk about the work. We're getting to know each other. And it's this sort of forming this lateral connection between people that has nothing to do with the arts hierarchies, nothing to do with fun the funding systems. Um, some people participating in that, but it's developing these links. Um, it's completely intergenerational. We have people in their 70s. We have some, um, some younger folks in their late teens um, that participate. Um, you know, artists at all all stages of their of their development, and um, for me, and it's I get to that back to sort of Jesse Wenty's kind of comment on sovereignty. It's kind of our sovereign space. It's like we talk about what we want to. Um, it's it's about the you know our relationship with each other and and our broader and our practice and that. Um, it's one of the most fruitful sp spaces that I have, and it's absolutely it's so enabled by by some technology. And obviously, there are. I don't want to pretend that the resources don't matter, and that um, that there. I'm sure there are access issues. We're accessing people who can get to a computer and have a good internet connection, and can get onto Zoom and so on. Um, but in other ways, it's actually a very low barrier um, barrier in terms of of the money and in terms of the the organizational effort that we that we kind of all we started sharing the organization of it so other people organize some some of the presentations and so on now and um, it's kind of expanding that way so where we're done yeah I'll, I'll go I I I think one thing that I've that I am thinking of and I'm I'm drawn to sharing is just this idea of in, of when artists do something or try something to just encourage them. I think that oftentimes we don't, as artists, we don't often get encouraged. We don't, we, it's always jumps to like, oh, this didn't work or I need to do this better or this didn't work. And, and I'm thinking to a conversation I, I, I had with an artist um, a few years ago, he, he did um, a, a, a song that he 
an, an art song, a, a memory opera that he had written. And he performed it in a, in a queer cabaret that I was curating. And I, I messaged him after the cabaret and I said, I think that this is really beautiful. And I really feel like this is the start of a solo show that you have here. And he wrote me back like a couple days later and said, thank you so much. I, I really don't think that it, that it is like, I, it's just a one-time thing and it, it, it's nothing. And I wrote back and I said, you know, I, I, I think that you really have something here. And if you ever want to talk more or you want to have a conversation or you, you, you want to work on something together, I would, I would love to. And he said, yeah, th thank you for that. But, but no. And then three years later, I got an email from him saying, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think that you're right. There is something there. Um, thank you so much for planting this seed. Like, let's have a conversation. And now we've created this the show and, and and toured it twice. So I think that there's something about just having those moments of encouragement to artists means so much. And I don't I don't think it happens often enough. Um, and it's something that I'm trying to in my own practice to try to 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 do more of and to encourage other folks to do too. So I just wanted to share that piece. Sure. Reagan, I cried a little when you said what you were doing. <laughs> so sweet. Um, yeah, I have an example of just like a community project that I worked on in the summertime. So myself and Tiffany Joseph, who used to work in Sneedquith, I currently still do. Sneedquith is the first Saanich village site. It's taught in Latin English right beside Butchart Gardens. So I worked on there doing restoration. Um, in removing the invasive plants, planting native plants. And Tiffany and I were down there one day and we were looking at this old decrepit wall that was a legacy from the cement plant and we thought about painting a mural on it. And so we um, got in contact with our friend at the CRD, Eric Kelch, who kind of took all of the grant writing into his own hands. And so um, me and Tiffany brought down community members from like the Sycom, um there was they have a summer camp and like a bunch of the youth we brought down and we asked them what they wanted to see on the mural. And so we took all of their ideas and kind of created this image to paint. Um, and so I invited Chaz Elliott to help me paint with it with uh, with me. And he brought down a few of his friends and community members to paint. And it was just this very collaborative collective community effort. And I was very thankful because I didn't have to do any of the grant writing or legwork. I just had, I got to show up and, and make art, which is why I'm in this profession. So that was a really valuable thing for us to be doing, just kind of inviting everyone to be a part of it rather than an isolated artist, just making an isolated thing um, that had, it has more meaning when more people are involved. And, um, I mentioned earlier having that community support where you you just make art and the grant stuff is is kind of figured out that was really really good for me. Yeah, hi Shka. Uh, before we pass, I, I will have to pass it over to Chris in, in a second just to kind of go make sure we have enough time for breakout sessions. But the the common thread that I'm hearing from all four of you is just, is really the core is relationships and trust and 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 that takes time. And I, and I think that a lot of organizations in terms of equity work or just being part of the community, it, it's struggling with the urgency of needing to, to do something while at the same time recognizing that trust takes time to build and it can take years. And so um, I, I just also don't want people to, feel, uh, don't be disheartened that trust takes time. It's just a reality of, of building relationships. And, um, and it, it starts today, like it starts today, it starts yesterday and it started, it should have started last year, years ago, but um, the best time is to start now um, because, you know, whether it's some of the community projects um, or even just, you know, Sean, your, your story about three years later, this is, this is what the seed did. It grew into this thing. Um, it's it's quite inspiring to to hear that. Any final last words before I pass it over to Chris, and then we go into breakout rooms from any of you. Hi, Shka, for facilitating this conversation, and thank you for all the panelists that were here. It was interesting to listen to you and and learn from you. Appreciate it. 
Thanks. Um, okay, thank you to to all, all four of you. Um, it's been really great to have this conversation. I know it's a short conversation uh, overall because we just didn't have as much time as we uh, I think we could have taken, um, but that's just what it is. Uh, so Sarah, Charles, Sean, and Reagan, thank you so much. Um, as we start to think about the transition into the conversation piece in the breakout rooms, um, which is going to be both an opportunity to debrief on what you've heard to, uh, throughout the day um, and your needs uh, and wants to support equity work going forward. I'm going to in introduce Chris Karabaka, the chair of CRD's new EDI subcommittee, uh, who will tell you a little bit more. Great. Thank you so much, Kenzie. And thank you again to Charles, Sarah, Sean, and Reagan. Amazing conversations. I know my mind and my heart are just churning. There's so much to, to just jump off and talk about. Um, while I'm giving these opening remarks, I just wanted to encourage anybody out there in video land, if you need the ASL or closed captioning uh, services, drop a, a comment in the chat so that Vimla can put you into the right breakout room. So make sure you do that while I'm talking. So um, hello, everybody. Yes, I'm Christina Karavaka, as Kenzie just graciously said. Uh, I am a guest to these unceded Lekwungen and Wasanich territory lands since 2018. My pronouns are she, her. I am a member of the CRD Arts Advisory Council, and I'm extremely honored to be the chair of our brand new Baby Steps EDI subcommittee. Such exciting work. Um, I also get to work on the Victoria Pride Society board, doing some pretty fantastic LGBTQ2 plus work there. And I'm the senior manager for Sanitary Community Services Division, where we are growing um, a delicate little diversity and community art portfolio that I'm hoping you're starting to hear more and more rumblings about. We definitely wanna continue that good work for our greater CRD area. So the EDI subcommittee, like wh why right now? Why do we have it right now? And why is it so prominent? I'm just reflecting on Jeremy Loveday's wonderful comments this morning about how we had a CRD Art Champion Summit way back in 2016. And the theme of that was really like, you know, we're a new organization. We wanna get feedback from the community. We wanna hear what you need, how we can serve artists, creatives, organizations, all of it better. And a little EDI equality theme started to bubble up then in 2016. Here we are, 2021, how many years later? And it's now so prominent. The drumbeat is so loud. And I think really ricocheting off of things that are happening globally and you know, um, south of the border as well. The entire theme of the summit today is to talk about equity and decolonization and action. What can you do? Don't wait for somebody else to do it. What can you do today? So the EDI subcommittee was formed to really put that action that's been bubbling around out there. How do we say, what are the true steps? What's implementable? What can happen? And so from the Arts Advisory Council, a little group of people put up their hands and said, I have a lived experience. I have a passion. I have an ability to educate and dedicate to this to this initiative, to this topic, and to do this for my community. And one of those people will be with us um, in the breakout rooms when we spin off in, in a minute. Um, but I think that impulse to create an equity lens that applies both to the operations of our granting body, as well as what we fund and how we fund it. That's really what we're going to be looking at this year. And that's, we're really starting to take an inventory of everything that's going on in the CRD, how we do the practice, where this money goes, who receives it, how we ask for it, who makes the decisions. And this is, a, this is an experience for us right now to hear from the community through these breakthrough groups, um, breakout groups, pardon me, to hear what you need. What are you, what needs to be reflected on and how we hold space, how we bring everybody together. So to that end, we have a couple of questions that you're gonna get pulled out into one of four groups. Um, and those two questions are, we want you to reflect on from the conversations you heard today, what is one thing that resonated for you and that you're going to take back to yourself or your organization to make a commitment on and to take action on? And the second question to ponder is, what would support you most in reducing barriers or strengthening underrepresented communities 
in your organization or in your practice. So I have four facilitators. I get to facilitate a group. Um, Rachel from the EDI subcommittee will also be facil facilitating as well as Kathy and Kenji, who I know you heard from as earlier presenters. And we're gonna go out into these breakout rooms and we're gonna hold those conversations and we're gonna talk about decolonization, EDI subcommittees, what's actionable for the community right now today. So um, at this point, I believe that Vimla is gonna take us out to breakout rooms. We'll have about 20 minutes to chat. And then we'll come back together as a large group and kind of pull out some of the larger themes and uh, next steps, personal and CRD wide.